Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, and today I'm joined by my good friend Ramesh Srinivasan, who is a professor at UCLA. Ramesh, what what are you the, a professor of? <laughs> it's so good to be with you, Patrick. Um, I study how technology is um, impacting societies uh, all around the world, both economically and politically and personally. But um, most importantly, I'm a diehard Warriors fan, lifelong baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me, tell me about uh, your Warriors fandom, you know, just a little bit. I mean, as a little kid growing up in the Bay Area, I'm from the South Bay. You know, anytime my parents would give me a shot to like, you know, peer into the world of entertainment and media and even sometimes video games, I would take it. So I grew up watching Run TMC, man. Just I love the flow of that offense. I love the passing. I love the shooting. I kind of loved how we could run up the score and get scored on a lot sometimes. <laughs> and uh, that was my history. And then I, like you, Patrick, uh, lived through decades of uh, very, very uh, difficult uh, to watch teams. Yet I watched them. And I remember I would like sneak down to sit front court at the Oakland Coliseum uh, for like 10 bucks. I'd pay 10 bucks to get into like, you know, the nosebleeds and then I'd like end up sitting right there next to the front next to the court a couple times back when we weren't the best of teams oh my god I did that too we, yeah we did that too we used to get like cheap seats and then because <laughs> no one was really there and security was kind of lax you would just like when people would leave at halftime you would come in take their seats and then eventually get booted yeah they were mostly chilling because we were always losing and every and all those people weren't there anyway especially after a little while living with the Warriors like you know, over these years, it's been really special. I've been super passionate. I love your podcast. I'm a total Warriors fan through and through. Um, I go crazy watching the games. I'm really passionate about them. Yeah, I love yeah, them. yeah. I love them so much. Yeah, no, it's awesome, man. We watched the opening night game tonight, the Lakers versus the Warriors, and we were, we were spazzing. <laughs> and so, I mean, I got, I had so many thoughts about that game i was tweeting like crazy i probably lost a few followers because i was so annoying but i want to ask you like what were your first impressions of the warriors this season and what were your thoughts on the game i mean i loved how the team hung in there it felt like we were getting smoked the pretty much the entire first half somehow we were within 10 i think it's because we balled out and played pretty good d um, you know, Curry couldn't really shoot this entire game, but honestly, the fact that we played hard, we stuck in there, we made some dumb mistakes in the first half, we hung in there, and then our depth, we have depth, uh, it really picked up, and we started scoring. Uh, we we are we have so much more offensive firepower, and basically, the team looked like it was on an offensive level, like it was Curry's passing offense again. There were a bunch of players we saw today. Um, who are capable of, of making the right pass, cutting in the right way, uh, passing the ball to the open man. And that's that's Warriors ball. I mean, it was really, really wonderful to see how they could step up like that. Even when Curry was playing hard, got a triple-double, but wasn't really shooting and lighting it up. He shot terribly, and I swear like they would not have even sniffed this game last season at all Like when he was shooting this, this terribly. And... I kind of agree with you. Like one thing that I thought there were like so many little thoughts that I had the whole time and I was taking notes and all this, but like the bottom line, and this was something that we saw a hint of during the preseason, but you know, there's only so much you can put on the preseason was like, I kept writing down, like, this is the return of the beautiful game. You know what I mean? The Warriors passing style, passing game, ball movement, back cuts, the stuff that they did during the dynasty and I won't get too far ahead of myself, but the mix of players that they were able to bring in when they couldn't get like their first tier, they couldn't get Nicholas Batum, they couldn't get Patty Mills, but they got Otto Porter Jr. And (laughs) kind of the man of the hour, uh, Nemanja Bielica. I mean, he was the man. He was the man. I mean, these are players who know how to move without the ball, how to pass, they have court vision. I mean, it's what we call IQ, right? I mean, they had high high IQ players. His stat line, Bielitsa played 26 minutes. He was six for seven from the field, one for one from three, two for two from the line. He had 
11 boards, four assists, one steal, and he was plus 20 with 15 points. I mean, what the hell? Like, <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, uh, Patrick, I saw Tim Kawakami uh, tweet this. Bielitsa was like plus 27 and Russell Westbrook was minus 27. I mean, that was like an epic tweet. And that really said it all. I mean, you know, there has been a lot of like questioning about Kerr also over the last two years, right? And I think that one thing that maybe some of us forgot or haven't paid enough attention to is that guy is an offensive mind. And, you know, he, when Kerr came to the Warriors, as we all remember, several years ago, he took an extremely talented team that was playing good, tough D under Mark Jackson and turned it into a superpower, right? I mean, look mm-hmm. what happened. We won, the, we, won the chi- you know, we won the chip the next year. We set the record the year after, and then we got Durant, right? So it was just like, it was great to see, you know, what this sort of vision is for a bunch of moving parts, for a bunch of depth, you know? And I think that's really important. I mean, the fact that this, I, I'm really impressed after, it's just one game, but seeing that, we got a couple. We got a couple young studs. Yet we have increased depth. Um, this is, you know, so far so good. Of course, it's early, but I mean, looks like Myers and Kerr. You know, at least Myers also knew what he was doing when he was, you know, getting these are these are minimum, you know, level players. I mean, watching Porter was playing tough. Bielitsa was this was one of the stars of the game. Iguodala so stabilizing for that team. That second unit. I mean, I have had questions and it may come up, right? Like it was Jordan Poole, Damon Lee, Iguodala, Bielitsa, and Otto Porter Jr. And I've said the concern that I have about that lineup is like, there's a lot of shooting. There's a lot of basketball IQ, a lot of savvy. But I do worry that they're a little unathletic and slow. But in this case, that basketball IQ, the passing, the smart playing, all that, all that jazz experience plus Jordan Poole, it actually worked for them. I, I was super impressed. This was really like kind of a tortoise and and the tortoise and the hare type thing, right? Like right. everybody knows like these Lakers players, right? They this is an all star team yeah. from 2012, yeah. and everybody was kind of assuming, like casuals were assuming that the Lakers was just going to take this one. And you know, like I wasn't saying that the Warriors were definitely going to win. But people were sleeping on the Warriors a little bit because a lot of people don't know that actually Jordan Poole is pretty good and they hadn't seen them during the preseason. So they started clicking. And I mean, that second unit, like, let's really quickly think back to who the Warriors had on their second unit last year. I mean, oh boy, uh, <laughs> Brad Wanamaker, Michael Mulder. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I'm super encouraged. How, how do you feel? seeing Iguodala and all those guys out there. I mean, it felt like we were watching a bunch of players who knew what they were doing, who knew who knew how to play and pass and like move without the ball. And I think the way that the second unit offense was able to initiate is partly because Jordan Poole is like sneaky athletic and he's very good. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I think he kind of moves. He's very decisive. He's very aggressive. And he kind of moves like a kind of a, we were talking about like a flash thunderbolt. He's like moves straight and rapidly. So basically what I saw happened a bunch of times is there would be one sort of like cut penetration into the defense and then just a bunch of passing and cutting occurring. So we just got a lot of good high percentage shots. I mean, Damian Lee played great. Poole was Mm -hmm. outstanding in this game after starting slow. I mean, look at that depth, right? I mean, we did, this is a very, very different uh, picture of a team last year it was just you know beg for curry to score 40 at times right yeah yeah and the whole tortoise and hare thing it it really was like the lakers started off strong they're like big and uh, intimidating like they're (laughs) but the warriors they just basically just kept at it kept at it i mean we've heard snippets of kerr coaching his teams over the years and a lot of those when he's in the huddle he always says like, hey, this is how a game goes. Let's just stay with it. Let's limit the turnovers, like yeah. play defense, all this stuff. And that's exactly what they did. Like at a certain point, the percentages and the expectations started playing out a little bit more and the Lakers started missing shots. Uh, the Warriors started hitting shots because they were down by like two points and Poole and Steph, their main scorers were like 
six for 20 something, you know what I mean? Yeah, we were missing a lot of open shots. I mean, Curry missed a lot of open shots in this game himself, which is just incredible to imagine if we played this type of system and if Curry starts hitting shots, I mean, Curry played great. He manned up, he, he boarded, you know, got a triple double, but you know, at the same time, it felt like we were, the Lakers looked old. (laughs) They had, they had two players play great. They're two superstars and they had this third supposed superstar, uh, not play very well, very inefficient Russell Westbrook, you know, and we had, you know, contributions of eight, nine players today. And that just made a huge difference. I mean, we started hitting those open shots. I remember you and I were talking about it just with a couple minutes left in the third, we were down, I don't know, like eight, 10 points, but it Mm -hmm. felt like if we hit one or two like open shots that we could just get on track. And then we just, be steamrolled in the fourth quarter. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly what happened. NFL fans hungry for a big win this week. DraftKings Sportsbook and official sports betting partner of the NFL has you covered. New customers can bet just $5 on any NFL team to win their game. And if they do, you win $200 in free bets. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available yet in your state, DraftKings won't leave you empty-handed. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contests. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TBPN. Bet just $5 on any NFL team to win their game and win $200 in free bets. If they win, you win with promo code TBPN this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only, new customers only, minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required. One per customer, restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. What I find really interesting, and I've talked about this in general before, during our lifetimes, I mean, we're the same age, during our lifetimes, the Warriors were so bad for a large chunk of that uh, until the dynasty and a couple of playoff teams here and there in the run TMC era. And the Lakers were always good. But when the Warriors finally got good, the Lakers were really bad, right? Yeah. And so I got to say, like, this might be, and this is probably the first time in our lifetimes that the Warriors and Lakers are both very good and both have title aspirations, right? Like we've never had this rivalry. It's crazy. I mean, imagine if, uh, you know, with, with this, this means that we don't have to have as much pressure put on, you know, Wiseman or Kaminga, of course, we, there was none really to begin with. Um, And most importantly on clay, even if we can play this sort of system, stay healthy and just staying, just keep staying the course, you know. Um, this was a good matchup for us today because, you know, the Lakers, quite honestly, were like just kind of completely dependent. I mean, LeBron had an incredible game, yet they mm-hmm. lost because there was just not enough contributions occurring uh, from other players. So, you know, I think the Lakers are going to figure themselves out very slowly. They're going to be there, you know, when it, when it counts. They have too much right. superstar firepower. But some of these older players that they were running out, I mean, Rondo looked really bad. Howard looked really bad, even though he was hitting, making free throws, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, Avery Bradley was one of their best players in the latter half of the fourth quarter and the last like four or five minutes of the game. We cut yeah. him recently, not to, put, not to put him down. Yeah, and he was just playing out of spite. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's – It's going to be, I mean, Carmelo had a couple moments, but wasn't in the game that much, right? I mean, uh, what's his name? DeAndre Jordan. I mean, he was there on the first play of the game. And do you remember him much of the rest of the game? So it's sort Mm -hmm. of like, it's like the Lakers have to figure out their own puzzle. And I think we see what could work for us. Of course, these, a lot of this, we're going to have to try this out with different matchups and so on. But I mean, Mm -hmm. it's exciting to see that Bielitsa, Porter, you know, these guys know how to play I and mean, these guys can play. And and the yeah. fact that Poole has turned into this kind of player, he is extremely, um, he's very skilled. I mean, he knows what he's doing. And that's all a ton of work that he's put in. I mean, yeah. before this game, I figured that if Anthony Davis scored 30, 35, they probably had a good chance of winning the Lakers. And he had 20 at halftime. 
Yeah. And I mean, the percentages eventually just played out, right? LeBron started off hot. He played a great overall game, but then, you know, his shooting did cool off a little bit. Yeah. I agree. Like if the Warriors had lost this game, I wasn't going to overreact to anything and I'm not going to overreact to this for the Lakers or the Warriors, but for the Warriors, like it is promising. It is promising to see that what was hinted at during the preseason is real, that they do have chemistry, that this beautiful game that we came to love so much from 2014 to 2019, that it is likely coming back in some form. And uh, the Lakers, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Like, they will figure something out. It may not be the most enjoyable brand of basketball. It might be like your turn, my turn type deal. But, uh, you know, I think these guys will both be standing somewhere, somewhere towards the end. Yeah, and I think today, you know, more than anything, I think we saw that what the Warriors need to focus on is playing their type of basketball. The thing that sort of surprised me, Patrick, is how well we played on defense. I mean, I think partly I noticed us getting a lot of deflections and steals. We did play very hard. We got some, we got more loose balls than I thought we would have. I think there's a system. There's, there's a type of way in which, you know, we are successful playing, especially with, you know, the head of the snake being Curry, but now it's like a Hydra, right? I mean, we've got a lot of other guys who can step up and hit open shots, make the right pass, and they're very adept, high basketball IQ players. And so we heard, I mean, I was listening to you you talking about it on this podcast, um, Patrick, about how, about that choice, you know, that came up is, are we going to just push in all our chips for a Bradley Beal? Or are we going to like, you know, kind of, build around Curry while also building for the future, you know? And it looks like that latter decision, you know, certainly seems like that, you know, we have more parts to play in the system, this Curry system. So let's keep playing this system. This is the system with much worse players went 15 and five at the end of last year. Right. I mean, we, we broke down at the end, but I mean, I think the system, let's keep playing the system and see how the league reacts to it. You know, I mean, it won us, three championships this system yeah. with Kevin Durant for two of them <laughs> that helped <laughs> exactly and one thing I wanted to uh, mention you referenced some of the criticism Kerr took last couple of years especially last yeah. year and you know like coaches are always open to criticism I thought a lot of it was unfair and you know last year was kind of tough for everybody to figure out there's so many things going on and I think you pointed out something like he is good at this when you give him players who know how to play basketball, you know, who are willing passers, who enjoy this type of of game. And Bob Myers, God bless him. Like he had his first list of guys he wanted and then his second list and who knows where these guys were, but they're, they're good finds and hopefully they put them in, some kind of cryogenic chambers so they don't they don't get injured. We need these guys to stay healthy. I mean, I was particularly thinking that just when you were saying that about Iguodala. I mean, look at how he looked today. I mean, he just looked like he's so stabilizing and solid. Yeah. Like he's in motion, you know, he doesn't really force that many passes. Like there's just constant kind of like motion and darting and you know, he was just fantastic to see him. You know, again, like Kerr always called him like the grown up on the court, right? Back in the mm-hmm. day when we had no bench. I mm-hmm. mean, now look at, I mean, look at, look at this now. So the fact that we kind of stabilize the team around, you know, the core of Curry and Draymond and Clay when he comes back, yet also have these sort of, you know, dynamite pieces like for the near future or even a little bit in the present you know, is amazing. So that's really exciting. We even saw Moody, you know, make a cameo. He played in flow, you know, he made, he made a couple of good plays. Got his first points. I mean, he was, he played in the system and I think we saw that today. Yeah. I mean, that's, what's going to make Moody. That's what's going to get him in the rotation faster than Kaminga, just the skill and the plug and play of like, you do this, you do that. And he's still, and he's already really good at those things. And Iguodala, I mean, he, He is not going to be able to do this every game. He's going to have to sit games. But the thing is, like, he's built for these kinds of games, these high leverage games, and sit him against OKC, sit him (laughs) against the Kings, you know? Opening night, yeah, at the at Staples Center, 
on TNT primetime. And he unspectacularly for a lot of people, but for us, like we know what he does. He stabilizes that unit and we need to keep him out of Porter Jr. And Bielitsa, man, we need to, we need at least two or two of those three healthy at all times. Yeah. And Otto Porter Jr. didn't play that many minutes, you know, probably because of matchup issues, but, you know, you could unleash him. I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling like it's a promising season. I think will be pretty enjoyable. Yeah, let's just, you know, buckle up and enjoy uh, what's to come here. I mean, I think the Warriors, you know, as I said, we're chasing wins. We're not focused. I mean, it's a different season. It's not about sort of trying to figure out and force Wiseman in or build the offense and, you know, kind of we have a different set of priorities now and we have the depth to be able to function in this kind of motion led offense and integrate the youth into it rather than kind of have a couple different identities. I I think Kerr got unfair criticism around that last year, but at the same time, I mean, mainly the criticism rested upon, you know, this kind of a scattered offensive identity, but we didn't have the players for that. And now we do everyone, you know, God bless them. I hope they just stay healthy and let's play them sparingly. Let's get these kind of wins and let's chase wins. I mean, that's what Kerr said we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Man, let's chase blowouts so that we could sit these guys and then throw Wiseman, throw Kaminga, throw Moody, throw Gary Payton, throw the whole summer league team in there, man. And then get them reps. Yeah. Be good. It'll be good. I'm just so excited for the season to start. Let's go get them on uh, on Thursday against the Clippers. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to the home opener. All right. (laughs) Thanks for being on, man. That was great to join you. Have a good night. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that is another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Epino, E-P-I-N-O, or at Oakland Warriors. You can find Ramesh on Twitter at Ramesh Media, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right Not man. as much Thanks. for my basketball tweets, but, you know, I'm right there. I'm following yeah. all the right, the right handles, including you. <laughs> Check us out at OaklandWarriors.com. And be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen. The Oakland Warriors podcast is produced by National Film Society and is a part of the Basketball Podcast Network. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time, and go Dubs. Go Dubs.